As one of our dear friends and colleagues always tells us, hope does matter. And as you look at the theme of this conference, we're just hopeful that you will find inspiration in the stories that you've heard over the past few days, um, that you found the information informative, that you'll be able to go back to your cities with new ideas, and continue to share the ideas and accomplishments that you are also making in your very own city. So we are very hopeful that um, this event this week has really helped your strategies that you are working on locally. I would like to also say that this event would not be possible without great logistical contractors. I want to give a shout out to Development Services Group, or DSG. They have helped all of us, including many of you, book your travel, your hotel rooms. I know Leslie is back there. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, <laughs> Bass, Marsha, and the whole team. We're just really thankful for their support. So, we're in for a treat today. Um, we have a video from our very own mayor of my great city, the city of Baltimore, um, followed by our wonderful, very supportive health commissioner. So, sit back, relax, and um, just listen to these inspiring words. And again, we thank you all for um, enduring with us. We know many had to leave and catch flights, so, but we're appreciative for those that were able to stay for us um, this morning. Good morning. I'm Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, and I want to thank you all for convening in Baltimore for the National Summit on Preventing Youth Violence. On behalf of the citizens of Baltimore, I wish that I could join you today, but among my representatives is my dynamic health commissioner, Dr. Lena Wynn. She and I have worked closely together to examine youth crime prevention and intervention from the perspective of public health. I now introduce Dr. Lena Nguyen. Good morning, everyone. Wow, this is amazing. It's a great turnout, fantastic energy. I am really delighted to, to, to be here with all of you today. And before I start, I want to just see in the audience, there's a bright spotlight on me, so I can't see very well. But let me see the, um, can I have all those from Baltimore City? Can you all stand up, please? So this is our team from Baltimore, thank you. So together with the mayor, we are thrilled to welcome you all to our city. And we, I, I wish to thank all of our organizers for hosting this just tremendous event. And I was unable to attend it for the first two days, but I've been asking people around about what they've been learning in the first two days. And I'm blown away by all these different outside the box ideas that all of you have been coming up with. And in general, you know, we in the city embrace the concept that it's not just, you can't tackle youth violence prevention only through a criminal justice policing lens. That's the reason why I'm here to speak with you as the health commissioner about how we can see violence as a public health approach or from a public health approach. But let me back up a second. You know, I'm an emergency physician and my greatest privilege and honor is being able to take care of my patients. And so I wanna tell you about a patient of mine who came in after three gunshot wounds. He had been shot twice in the chest and once in the abdomen, 17 years old. So when he came in, we knew what to do. We knew based on the medical approach that what we need to do is to insert a chest tube. We knew that we had to intubate him. We knew that we had to pump him blood. We knew all these medical interventions that we could take. And then, we looked at his chart, and it turned out that he had been in our ER just a month ago for a gunshot wound, two months ago for a stab wound, six months ago because he had punched someone and broke his hand. And as we were working to resuscitate him, I couldn't help but think, how many interventions were there before? How many opportunities were there before for us to intervene? And even beyond that, what else is it that we could have done to prevent that bullet, those bullets that day, from reaching this patient? So that's why, as you go through, and as you go through the rest of your conference, and then go back to everywhere else that you're working, 
I want to share three thoughts with you, three things that we're doing here in Baltimore City, three approaches that we're taking here in Baltimore City. The first is that we embrace violence as a public health issue. It's certainly a health issue because there are people dying from violence. But we embrace a public health approach because we do programs like Safe Streets, which is based on the National Cure Violence Model. Through Safe Streets, we hire individuals who are from the communities that they serve. They walk the streets of the city and they intervene. They mediate conflict where they see it occurring. That's a public health approach, recognizing that just like other diseases, violence is something that spreads from person to person, and that's why we're able to interrupt violence where it occurs, with the individuals who are the most credible messengers. We also strongly believe, because we see violence as a public health issue, we also strongly believe that we have to intervene as early as possible, as far upstream as possible. Last month, we launched a program in Baltimore called Vision for Baltimore, which is to get every child glasses who needs them. It's estimated in our city that up to 10,000 children need glasses but aren't getting them. And you know, I'm all for research and studies, but we don't need another study to show us that if kids don't have glasses, they can't learn. And if kids don't have glasses, maybe they're labeled as being disruptive. They're being put back further in class, in their grades. Actually, when there was one thing that could have been earlier, that could have been done earlier, to prevent them from needing those other youth violence prevention strategies later. So we see something as simple as glasses as a youth violence prevention plan. We see things like preventing lead poisoning as also helping our children be able to achieve their full potential because our ethos in public health is that where a child grows up should not determine if that child grows up. That's what we do. And I see that this is something that this audience embraces, that this, this is the group that really embraces this. I know I've had conversations with Theron, with many of, the, many of our, our representatives here in, um, from DOJ, and all of you really understand the idea that we cannot just look at someone as the perpetrator of violence. So here's the second thing I hope that you'll keep in mind. So violence is a public health issue, but also that we cannot think about violence without also addressing trauma. You know, one of the most humbling experiences I had when I came to my position in the city was I was speaking to this group of youth. And I had just started, and I thought that I knew what these 8 to 13-year-olds, I thought I knew what they would want to talk about. In the health department, you know, we are also known as the agency of bugs, drugs, and sex. <laughs> so I thought they would ask me about gonorrhea and smoking and drugs and whatever. And I, that's what I thought I was there to talk about. And I asked these youth, assembled, just what do you want to talk about? And without exception, they all said one thing. They talked about mental health. Blew me away. They didn't actually use the words mental health, but they talked about trauma. They talked about the trauma of being handcuffed in front of their classmates in the school cafeteria and thrown into the back of a police car. They talked about the trauma of growing up so poor that they wouldn't know whether they would have a roof over their heads or food that night. They talked about the trauma of being the only person in their family who gets up in the morning because everybody else in their family is addicted to drugs. And so I think about that experience now because I couldn't have imagined that these eight-year-olds would be telling me about this. But if we are to really make a difference in addressing violence, we have to also look at individuals not as the perpetrators of violence, but also the victims of deep trauma. Deep trauma that likely has been unexpressed for a long time. And it's not part of it is mental health. And yes, there is a lot of stigma around mental health. And yes, we have been incarcerating for decades individuals who need help for mental health. Rather than, that, rather than treating it. But it's also about trauma because it shouldn't just be that when somebody gets a mental health diagnosis, 
that mental illness diagnosis, that that's when they get help for their trauma. And that's what we began doing in the city. We now have mental health services available in nearly 120 of our schools. We've also begun doing, under our Deputy Commissioner Olivia Farrell, who's here somewhere, um, there she is. Okay, so we've also started doing trauma-informed care trainings, where um, thanks to support from SAMHSA, we're training all of our frontline city workers on how to recognize and treat the effects of trauma. So that, I hope that all of you will keep that in mind too, that we have to aim upstream in violence, but then we also have to address the impact of trauma. Third, this is one thing I know you've all talked about a lot in the conference already, make sure to look at other related issues as well. One of the core principles of public health is we believe health is related to everything, right? If our kids aren't healthy, they can't learn. But the other way around too, that lack of education also impacts poverty, which then impacts health. The same when it comes to violence as well. We can't look at violence without addressing trauma, but we also can't look at violence without addressing addiction. And something that we've done in the city is to make it clear that our principles are, thanks to our mayor, that our principles are that addiction is, a, is an illness, is a disease, and that we have to focus first and foremost on saving lives, which is the reason why last year we got legislation passed so that as of October of 2015, I issued a blanket prescription for the antidote, the opioid antidote naloxone to 620,000 residents of our city. You know, we knew that there were more people in our city dying from overdose than are dying from homicide. And at the same time, addiction is so closely tied to all these other issues in criminal justice as well. That most of our drug arrests are for, are related to drugs in, or uh, of arrests are, are related to drugs in some way. So we recently are piloting a program together with the state's attorney's office, together with the police department and many of our partners around the city, including our behavioral health authority, behavioral health system Baltimore, called LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, such that individuals who are caught with small amounts of drugs are going to be offered treatment instead of incarceration. That's the direction that we have to turn, to look at how violence is tied to all these other issues as well. So I want to end with three ideas. Three ideas that I hope all of you will take back with you when you go back to all the important work that, 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 that you're doing. The first idea is to call out the problems that we see. Just like in medicine, if we don't diagnose the problem, we can't treat it. And there are so many issues that we see, and it's going to take courage, but we have to call them out. So call out poverty as a public health issue, call out violence as a public health issue, call out racism as a public health issue. Let's make sure that we address them, but we can't address them without first recognizing that they exist in the first place. Second, don't be afraid to look outside the box and to partner with individuals who might be surprising partners for you. Here in the city, under our mayor's direction, we have been leading partnerships that not only see violence with the police department, state's attorney's office, but also with health, also with our, with our neighborhood groups, also with our faith leaders, with so many others here in our city who are embracing this call to action. So don't be afraid to look outside the box and think, can I think about getting glasses as a violence prevention strategy? Can I think about lead pain prevention? Can I think about nurse home visiting? This is what I can think about in health, in your respective fields. There probably are other things that may be non-traditional ways of conceptualizing violence, but may be just the answer that you're looking for. Third, don't forget to do something right now. Don't wait. And specifically, I've been thinking about this because right after this event, and I'm afraid that I'm going to have to go after this, but right, right, right after this event, I'll be headed to a press conference with our members of, our, our Baltimore members of, of Congress, with Congressman Cummings, with Congressman Sarbanes, um, and that's um, a call to action, national call to action by Representative John Lewis, who, as you know, last 
week to stage the sit-in around gun violence and why we need to address gun violence. I think, you know, having seen so many of my patients getting shot and killed, having seen in our communities, it's not just one event that happens, one tragic event that happens. It's also here in our city, last year, 300 people died from gun violence. When we look to see the trauma that our communities are feeling every day, when we see our 14-year-old patients getting shot in the neck and being paralyzed from the neck down, when we see our three-year-old patients who get shot in the head and are now brain dead, I mean, this is what we see every day. We can't wait to take action. If I were in the ER and I were seeing a patient of mine who were unresponsive, if I saw a patient of mine who has, who has heart disease and cancer, who was in a car accident, and I don't know what's happened to this person, it may be very complicated. The solution may take many, may take a long time. The solution may not even work initially. It would never be an option to wait. Would never be an option to say, well, let me let somebody else handle that. Let me, you know, I know this is too complicated, so let me wait for the oncologist to come in. Let me wait for the heart surgeon. It would never be an option to wait. And so I hope we see the call to action for gun violence, the call to action for violence, the call to action for youth violence, all of this is urgent. We feel that fierce urgency of now all of us in this room feel that urgency. So let's do something now. Let's aim for action. Let's call, the, let's call to action. Let's call out the problems that we see. And let's continue to make a difference in our communities to save lives. Thank you all very much. Good morning. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't hear you. Good morning. We want to make sure the live streaming audience can hear that you're here and that you're still pumped and excited because we've got something really, really different to present now. Um, I mentioned it a little bit on Monday, but I want to talk a little bit about our initiative called Building Trust and Justice. We know that trust between residents and the justice system is just one of the keys to safe communities. How many of you all think that it doesn't matter whether your communities have trust in our systems? Right, not a single hand is going to go up, because we all know how important that is. When police and other criminal justice professionals have the confidence of citizens, there's greater respect for the law, and as a rule, there's actually less crime and less disorder. We call this procedural justice. Basically, procedural justice says that when a community feels that the law is being administered fairly and without bias, they will support law enforcement and other justice system professionals. We heard that on Monday from, from the police commissioner in, Bo in Boston about how important it was for them to have relationships with the community and how low their rate, violent crime rates among youth are because of those relationships. In other words, the safety of our communities and the legitimacy of our justice system are integrally tied together. Two years ago, we no launched the National Initiative on Building Community Trust and Justice. The basic idea of this initiative is to build on what we already know about procedural justice and help communities to begin to heal historic rifts that are so often centered on the justice system. Ferguson was just an example of many of, of how simple distrust can erupt in a community when, you, when you're not expecting it to erupt. That balloon analogy that we saw on, on um, was that Tuesday or Monday? It's all running together. The balloon analogy we saw on Monday is not just about the impact of trauma and things on, on individuals. It impacts communities in a similar fashion. So we're working with several private and academic partners and an advisory board of law enforcement practitioners and community and faith-based leaders. These groups are working to repair fractured relationships between the justice system agencies and the citizens they serve. And notice I'm being very intentional in my, in my words. This is not a police issue. This is a system issue. As we saw in Ferguson, it's about how we assess fees and fines. It's a much bigger issue than the relationship with law enforcement. But as I say to our law enforcement partners, we appreciate you. We are so grateful 
for law enforcement and their relationship is important because they are the face to most communities of our justice system. So currently, six cities are serving as demonstration sites. One of the things that we're doing is bringing together law enforcement officers and community residents to talk to each other, notice I said talk with each other, to each other, not at each other, about the state of their relationships and to figure out how to make that relationship stronger. We're pleased that what we're seeing in these six sites and that, that we're seeing progress, but we also know that there are other communities across the country that are engaged in similar efforts. And we know that there are a lot of great ideas about how we can build stronger bonds between communities and justice systems. So we wanted to find a way, a creative way, an innovative way, a different way. You heard them talk about that we're, we're, um, we're really into innovation these days and doing things differently. And what we're about to do today is something we have never done at the Department of Justice. So we wanted to hear from people about our ideas. So I happened to be in a meeting at the White House several months ago and was talking to the executive director of the Major City, Major City um, Sheriff's Association. And he was talking to me about this partnership he had with Adventures. And I particularly, what we were talking about is how do we hear from young people? Because, you know, we all have wonderful ideas, but as we've seen the past two days, having young people involved in the conversation is critical to solving this issue. Is that right? I want to know you're out there. And did, did we lose our young people? So in talking with um, Adventures, they have a network of universities that they work with to address some of the country's most pressing social challenges through a research-based competition. So in working with the folks at Adventures, we decided that um, we're going to figure out how we can deal with this issue, tackle this issue about building community trust um, using the Adventures model. So I want to thank Tony Scro. Where's Tony? I know he's here somewhere. There he goes. I want to thank him for, in particular, for coming up with this innovative way of, of not only are we having young people figure out how to reach young people, by having this, this competition of universities across the country, we're also sensitizing and educating a whole group of young future leaders about this issue who, whether they win this competition or not, um, will be out there spreading this issue. So I also want to recognize um, Sean Farrell. Where's Sean? I know he's, there he goes. Sean Farrell, please join me in. Thank you. Um, for putting this together. And I will say that, that I don't know how many, of, yeah, everybody here knows how quickly the federal government works, don't you? We are just, we just, we, we have an idea and we execute it on it tomorrow, don't we? We don't. But we got this done, so you know what a feat that was. So we, we received some wonderful, wonderful proposals from many of the universities, and we have two finalists that are going to present today. We have a team from Missouri State University. You're going to come up, but stand up right now just so they can recognize you. And we have a team from Texas Christian University. Stand up. So we, we, we brought them here so that you can select the winners. Now, they're all winners. I, I had breakfast with them this morning and made sure. Now, they are fiercely competitive, so do not, do not misunderstand me when I'm saying they're all winners. They intend to win. Um, and you guys will get to vote. I'll explain how we vote later. But it's important for us to preview this with the communities who are really closest to these issues and to find out from you all what you think about these proposals. So what we're going to do is have each team spend about 15 minutes um, on their presentations. After their presentations, I will ask them questions. They don't know what the questions are, and neither do I, because I haven't seen these either. And so this is new and fresh, and I'm just as excited as you all are. Um, and then while we have the My Brother's Keeper panel, you all will be voting. We'll tally the votes, and then we'll um, announce the winner. So I am first going to call up Missouri State to make their presentation. So let's give them a warm round of applause while they set up. Bill loves his coffee black with a pinch of sugar. 
Leo volunteers at her child's school. Leo coaches his son's Little League baseball team. Leo takes her dog on a two-mile walk every morning. Leo is a father, a daughter, a brother, a friend. Leo is a law enforcement officer. There are over 780,000 Leos nationwide who put on a uniform and go to work just like us. Except, guarding their community is not just a day job. It's 24-7, ensuring the safety of the citizens they serve and protect. Meet Leo is a place to hear the stories of the people behind the uniform. It's a place to be reminded that we're all human, and that our communities are stronger, safer, and happier when we work together. Good morning, we are Missouri State University. I'm Kimberly. I'm Abby. And I'm Megan. The Meet Leo brand shows that police are more than just the uniforms they wear. They have a family, friends, and hobbies, just like you and I. Meet Leo is the first step to change. Meeting law enforcement officers allows us to find commonality and create relationships. These connections make the issues personal and give us a reason to take further action. Today, we are excited to share with you Meet Leo. Throughout our 14-week journey, we met with law enforcement officers, educators, judges, lawyers, university students, and community leaders. Seven focus groups, 40 interviews, and over 1,000 survey responses led us to determining our target markets. The first were college students, specifically, the first were millennials, specifically college students. Next was Generation Z, which included those 10 to 13 years old, and also their teachers. There are over 83 million millennials nationwide. This makes up the most diverse generation with over 44% being part of a minority race or ethnic group. Currently, there are 1.2 million international students studying in the United States, with the enrollment of these individuals expected to increase by 10%. During our focus groups, some students shared stories of being racially profiled, while other students' only interactions with law enforcement were during simple traffic stops. All students agree that there was a disconnect between law enforcement and the community, but those that lacked a personal connection weren't motivated to take action. To reach millennials, we took to social media. Through our interactive platform, users within the Meet Leo community were encouraged to share their own content rather than reposting existing online stories. We wanted to show that officers are just like us. To kick this off, we challenged our Facebook community to share stories about their Leo loved ones using hashtag Meet Leo. If not for our unique platform, these stories likely would have gone unheard. In just one month, we met over 45 Leos a boyfriend, a cancer survivor, and even those killed in the line of duty. If you look on your tables today, you'll see just some of the heartfelt stories that were shared using hashtag MeetLeo. To give our followers a better understanding of the life of a Leo, we created videos to post on our Facebook page. We met Leo Nicole while spending the day with the Kansas City Police Department. She patrols the same high crime streets that she grew up on, and she invited us on a ride along to see firsthand what she deals with every day. Watch as Leo Nicole takes you through the streets of Kansas City. One thing that I preach often when I'm on my like social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, like I would tell my family and friends, we're not your enemy. Um, we all have family and friends. Um, myself, as well as other officers, are also from this area, and those who may not be from this area, but been on the department long enough to know that we care about the community that we serve. We care about the interactions with the people that we deal with every single day. We're not here, our goal is not to take everybody to jail or take your kids away from you. We're actually here to serve and protect. We risk our lives every day to put this badge on and, and put this uniform on and step out here on these streets. Contact your local department. You come to the police station, say hi. If I'm rolling down the street, wave me down. We're human, we'll have a conversation to the community that we're patrolling. We're here to interact. Hard time to talk to me. 318. 318, go ahead. In just four short weeks, we gained over 1,100 likes. Over 160,000 people from 16 states and 22 countries were given the opportunity to meet Leo. Encouraging the public to meet law enforcement officers is important, but teaching officers how to best interact with their communities is equally vital. We conducted a content analysis of over 200 police department Facebook pages and analyzed the posts for content, frequency, and presentation. Many of the pages that we viewed were outdated or rarely used, and less than 50% of the pages analyzed showed engagement with the community. To help departments better engage with their followers, we developed a social media toolkit. This turnkey toolkit 
includes examples of successful versus unsuccessful posts, explains the frequency of how to involve with, with current Facebook users, and gives tips and recommendations on how to increase their current social media following. This kit provides a valuable resource for departments, even if they can't hire a full-time media employee. If you think this kit would be beneficial, we brought some with us so you can take home with you today. During focus groups with millennials, we uncovered a key insight about international college students. Khan, a Missouri State student from Pakistan, shared that he felt genuinely fearful for his life when he saw a youth police officer. Other students shared that their perceptions on law enforcement were formulated on what they saw in the media. And after speaking with several universities, we realized that a student's interaction is limited to an officer telling them what not to do. From this, we knew we needed to focus some of our efforts towards international students. As they learn more, they are an opportunity for immediate change. Their perceptions are much more likely to shift from uncertainty and fear to respect and appreciation. To create an approachable environment where officers and students could interact, we hosted the Meet Your Leos event. To promote the event, we sent email blasts, spoke with the Association of International Students, and hung posters around campus. Attendees participated in stations manned by local officers, such as an Instagram photo booth, Meet Leo henna tattoos, and sobriety field tests. Um, local businesses got involved, too, by making donations. While some of the students were hesitant at first, they were sharing their personal experiences on our social media, and a few of them left even sporting our Leo tattoos. We knew that the students would have some preconceived ideas about the officers, but we noticed the officers distancing themselves from the students, too, which implied that they had some biases towards the students as well. But by the end of the event, they were actively engaging and sharing laughs with the students. Thirteen countries were represented at the event, and both students and officers had nothing but good things to say. The event generated press with the local broadcast news station and our university newspaper. This event is scalable and easily adaptable to universities across the nation and would be most impactful during an international student orientation. Police and university administrators both agreed that a positive relationship with a LEO immediately upon students' arrival would be beneficial to both students and police. While focusing our efforts on social media and millennials was the obvious choice, we had to stop and ask ourselves, is there another group? another generation that is even more important in creating community trust with law enforcement? And that answer is yes. Generation Z learns with technology and communicates using images. They are independent enough to start making the majority of their own decisions, but they are still learning where they fit into society, making them the ideal target market. This generation needs a safe place to talk about issues that not everybody agrees on, and that place is in the classroom. During focus groups, teachers begged us for a way to talk about stereotyping and racism because they're middle schoolers. We're dealing with these things every day. As a result, we wrote the Friends with Leo curriculum, which quickly became the heart of our campaign. This turnkey program is geared towards 10 to 13 year olds and taught by a law enforcement officer. It replaces workbooks with an app and interactive games. Because the media tends to not portray the whole entire story, we knew we needed to focus less than one on communication. Students in this lesson learn the importance of knowing the whole story before making assumptions based on situational evidence. Lesson two focuses on the importance of stereotyping and racism through our Who Am I app. This app was created to show that the students also make judgments. Students are able to play the app we created directly from our website. Launch the app brings up the game on a new page. Once the app is launched, Players are shown one of our scenarios that were inspired by conversations with our focus groups. Players pick the character they think best fits the given description. If the wrong choice is selected, players are given an explanation and the opportunity to see the correct answer. If the correct character is selected, players receive more information on the character and are prompted to move on to the next level. This app serves to show players that judgments cannot be made solely on clothing, hairstyles, or skin color. Because more students are using violence to solve their problems, Lesson 3 teaches conflict resolution and what it means to be an outstanding citizen. An online quiz provides real-time results and allows for discussion of how students should handle certain ethical scenarios. Now watch as we walk you through the halls of Allen Village for Friends with Leo Education Launch. The week of April 11th, the Missouri State Ad Team set off for Kansas City, Missouri to introduce their Friends with Leo curriculum to 6th graders at Allen Village School. The kickoff started with a 3D police car hanging from the ceiling to pique student curiosity and introduce them to the Meet Leo campaign. 
That morning, we were greeted by 62 curious minds, anxiously waiting to see what Meet Leo was all about. Officer Watson of the Kansas City Police Department was on hand and ready to discuss conflict resolution, ethics, stereotypes, and racism with the students. The Meet Leo app designed by the MSU ad team was a big hit. Students were surprised to discover that they made judgments based on clothing, hairstyle, and race. Next, the students brought out their computers to play the interactive ethics game. Officer Watson walked through each scenario and discussed that all actions have consequences, no matter how small or large they may be. The students talked about how their actions not only affected them, but also how it affects their community as a whole. Throughout the day, other Leos involved with youth programming stopped by to hang out and see what Meet Leo was all about. To end the day's lessons, the students asked Officer Watson burning questions they had about the personal life of a Leo. Afterwards, we spoke with Officer Watson and asked him what he thought about the curriculum. I definitely think that this would be an excellent program to interact with the students because it's so important, again, for the kids to see another side of the law enforcement that we are caring individuals. I'll be more than happy to present it to all the schools that I can. We also asked Principal Dr. Amy Washington what she thought about the day. You could see kids enjoying the interaction and that's part of the goal. If you're going to establish a relationship, you've got to have an enjoyable experience with that person. That was happening today between kids and the officers that were here. To conclude, the students were given a Friends with Leo worksheet to reflect on the day. As the kickoff was coming to an end, the positive impact was visible. The students were all smiles and eager to tell their family about their new Leo friends. Most importantly, the students learned who Leo really is. Leo isn't just someone in a uniform. Leo is someone they can rely on and turn to, a friend. These students now understand how they play an important role in making a happier, safer, and stronger community. A pre and post test measured students' knowledge on criminal profiling, ethics, and decision making. 70% of students shared their day with their families. So why is this important? It illustrates that the curriculum doesn't end in the classroom. It opens doors for families to have those critical conversations and ignites a chain reaction, challenging preconceived notions of law enforcement. All elements of our integrated campaign are housed on our live website, meetleo.org. Watch as we walk you through each page. Meetleo.org is an interactive platform that changes the way police officers and community members interact. A continuous scroll down the home page shows users a live feed from our Facebook and gives a brief overview of the other pages they can view from our site. Here, viewers are introduced to Leo's Nicole and Elise and see firsthand the personal life of a law enforcement officer. Rather than having a traditional About Us section, we created Who is Leo, a shareable YouTube video that captures the mind of our target audiences and explains exactly who a Leo is and what our campaign is all about. The blog tab gives visitors the opportunity to meet the Leos we encountered along our journey. Clicking on the picture allows you to read their stories and share them via social media. Information about our Friends with Leo curriculum is also housed on our website under the Educators tab. Here, teachers are able to see a curriculum preview and contact us if they are interested in receiving the full curriculum. Located at the bottom of the page are downloadable versions of the anchor posters that go along with each lesson. From beginning to end, our campaign was centered around humanizing law enforcement, building community trust, and enhancing relationships between the youth and Leos. Through social media, we shared stories of officers beyond the badge. An international event turned fear into understanding and created an immediate impact. The Friends with Leo curriculum used an app lessons, and interactive games to build a stronger community. Meet Leo is a campaign designed to not only encourage citizens to gain trust in their law enforcement, but to encourage law enforcement to, re to regain trust in their citizens. While stronger trust can't be achieved overnight, educating a younger generation provides the best path. Ryan, a future Leo, said it best. Once you learn their story, it becomes much easier to understand their behavior. It doesn't mean you shouldn't serve justice but it means you can serve justice from a place of empathy instead of hate. Thank you. That was fabulous.
Um, I hope our live streaming audience was just could be could enjoy that as much as we did who were physically present. So you all weren't here earlier in the week to hear Theron talk about his technological skills, um, but, and I have even less. Um, so what you've done today is really challenged us and opened up a way of thinking. So um, we've got lots of communities represented here. Um, if you were them, um, what would you tell them would be the next step for them if they want to use your campaign? How could they bring that campaign into their communities? Are you speaking about it like the entire campaign or just like a specific aspect? Whatever. Uh, answer it any way you I, want to. Yeah, I think a great way to start would be with social media because it's social media is right there. It's ready to go and it's, you know, it's, it's easy to get those stories out there if you know the right way to go about it. So, you know, like what we did, we used a hashtag and encouraged people to share those stories. And that really, that was a way for them to share the stories that they might not have had before. And it really encouraged the people that viewed those stories to think about law enforcement in a different way. And I think that that's something that you can start doing in your community almost immediately, is start getting those stories out there and sharing those different stories that people might not have heard before. So one thing that, that I, I, you and I know the answer to, but they don't know the answer to about how um, easily this is to do, how much, what was your budget to do this? How much did it cost you to put, do this? What did you have, how much money did we give you to work on this? $2,500. Did you hear that? $2,500. Um, and look what we got. And so I say that to you all to say that, to make sure that you know that you can do this. You can do this. Now, um, two of you, who's graduated and getting the MBA? Two of you are doing that. Um, and you're still in school. I will be finished in December. So, um, <laughs> but I think, that, um, I think that they can leave you their information and you know how to get them on their Facebook. Um, <laughs> These are resources that you ought to tap. They're new college graduates, or soon to be MBAs and college graduates who are uh, looking to be able to share what they have. I, how about, is that a safe way to say it? Um, um, so the question I have for you, if you were me, um, and um, sitting in my shoes, what would, you, what would you have me do with this campaign? I personally think the most important aspect of our campaign, and I think a lot of you guys would agree, since you guys are here for the youth conference, is our, our curriculum. I think that brings to the table something that needs to be discussed. And I think Dr. Wynn, she had mentioned how we need to have those discussions about racism and stereotyping, and we need to acknowledge that they exist. And that once we do that, that's the first step. And I think our app and the way our curriculum is set up, that that helps tackle that problem, and I think Students, they have to go to school, mm -hmm. so especially at that age, so they're learning what the teacher is teaching them or what the officer is teaching them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I know that you, you all are the ones who got here early and have had some exposure to the conference. Um, based on the research that you all have done and the work you've done, if each of you could just give one piece of advice to these communities. Well, and I want to say that before we do that, I want to say that the benefit of this present, of what you all have pulled together, is I asked you to figure out how to reach young people, but you did more than that. You, you helped us reach young people, how to reach law enforcement, how to reach teachers. They, they covered the full spectrum of people re represented in the community, so thank you for that. But if you would. So I'll let you decide who goes first, but one word of advice, one word of wisdom based on what you've learned through this that you would like to share with this wonderful audience <laughs> here and on live stream. Yeah, um, I think for me personally, just that last quote that was up on the screen, once you learn their stories, you understand their behavior. And for us, we learned so many stories throughout this process and we were able to understand their behavior and because of that, it made this process that much more impactful and that much more important. I think a really big takeaway um, for me from all of this was realizing how young the, that children become affected by these issues. When we spoke with the students in um, the Allen Village Middle School, we were just really shocked that not only had they been exposed to all these issues at such a young age, but they had such a deep understanding of the issues and that they were able to have these conversations just really amazed us and that was kind of what inspired to create the curriculum and inspired us to create the curriculum in the first place. Thank you. My piece of advice would be, honestly, to go out and meet a law enforcement officer. If you see them in the community, don't be afraid of them and don't, don't be timid and things like that. 
One of the officers that we had met with, um, he told us a story about how he was in the grocery store and a parent of probably like a six, a six or seven year old had mentioned, um, hey, don't be careful, like that officer's gonna take you to jail if you act up. Mm -hmm. And the officer went over and talked to the guy and was like, hey, just so you know, like that kind of instills fear. And that's the start of it. So my piece of advice, if any of you are parents of young ones, is to just kind of try to hold back on that because that's only just the beginning. Please join me in thanking this wonderful team. Oh wait, I wanna do something. So there are two members of the team who didn't present. Would you come up here too so that people can see you? Yeah. So I just want you to recognize that, there's, that, that, that we had three wonderful presenters, but they also had other additional support that came up with this campaign. So thank you very much. For that. <laughs> All right, stay close because we'll call you back up at the end. Thank so we're going to now turn to our next presenters. Give them time to get their presentations ready. So now we'll hear from Texas Christian University. So please join me. Oh wait, they're switching out mics, so I'm gonna stall for a minute. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna ask them later. For those of us who, how many of you don't have a Facebook account? I know I'm not the only dinosaur in this room. Okay, all right, that's really pretty. And Theron is over here going, mm, mm. He doesn't have a Facebook account either. I don't know what he's doing. So I, I will ask Missouri later, for those of us who don't have Facebook, how can we access this wonderful material besides, besides going to our friends who have Facebook? So I, I, just out of, I'm stalling in case you can't tell, um, just out of principle now, I, I refuse to get a Facebook page, but I have a twin brother who does have a Facebook page, and he made the mistake of accessing it from my iPad, and I have a memory, I don't remember names, but I remember numbers and stuff, so I do remember his password. Don't tell him, but I have not accessed Facebook through his account yet. All right, are we ready for Texas Christian University? Please join me in welcoming the TCU team. Thank you so much for having us today. We're so excited to be speaking to this audience about a project we care about so deeply. My name is Taylor Hardy. I'm Kate Hamill. I'm Katherine Rash. I'm Martha McAuliffe. And I'm Abigail Yonker. The overarching goal of Project Unity was to create stronger relationships between youth and law enforcement. We want to begin today with a video that really exposes the root of the misunderstanding. It was a vital part of our creative campaign. <coughs> day with the intent to help. I'm not out to get you. I don't want the trouble. But some of these kids just live in a bubble. They think I want to take them or their family to jail. The relationship between us has become so frail. Since I'm in uniform, I've become a target for violence. I don't have the option to run, but I'm careful to pull out my gun. You've got to understand I have seconds to make a decision. I've got to depend on my instinct my broken vision. Because like I said, I don't want to hurt you. But sometime, just one time, try stepping in my shoes. They just don't understand. My father and brother have both gone to jail, which in turn made my relationship with cops become very frail. See, I know that the outs can get me, 